الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور صدق الله العظيم إن شاء الله we'll be starting a new series in our tafsir. And this new series has to do a lot with the issues that are out there and especially setting our guidance correct and our compass correct in the way that we can take from the Quran and understand those issues through the Quran. A lot of the things we know that almost every facet of life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us the instructions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us how do we live our life. Yet we find ourselves, we're not finding those answers. We're not implementing those answers. And sometimes it's just a lack of knowing those verses are even out there. And time after time, we'll see many times, many, many times, there's many opportunities where we should have the guidance of what does the Quran tell us? What does Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam teach us in this matter, so that we can actually, we can actually implement those things and we can actually use those things. So, with that intention, inshallah, we're going to get started. And some of the things that we'll be mentioning, they're issues that are widespread. In like I used to say before, in the past. If you were to mention these things out open, it seems as if it's you know against the norm, it seems as if it's a taboo. But society has come to a point where these things are being shown to our kids, these things are being shown to our in, in their stores, in the libraries, readings are happening, and it becomes very important for us to address them head on. Because in Allah la yastahimin al haq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't shy away from the truth. So no matter what the topic may be, and there's some topics, inshallah, we have planned out, it becomes very important that we understand these topics, especially as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the Quran and what the verses regarding those things are. And we know that this is the month that a lot of individuals, they're celebrating uh, pride, the pride that they have, the sexual deviance to do what they want, the pride that they have, According to them, their worldview, their sin that they're doing is something that is something of uh, celebration. And we'll see, inshallah, what the problem is and how we can actually, you know, understand this problem in the Islamic perspective. I just want to mention before getting into this that, you know, we didn't have the slides, but the slides are available on Facebook, um, on the stream on Facebook. But the problem that we see is everybody is in this time of secular individualism. And what that means is you are trying to make yourself happy and please yourself according to your desires and your wants. So for example, in the 1962s, there was a lot of things that happened throughout the years and decades. Something that was permissible became that, something that was uh, legal became illegal. Something that was illegal became legal. And as time goes on, things will continue changing. And the moral compass of individuals is always going to change as long as they are not grounded in Quran and Sunnah. If they are grounded in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying and what the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, then that moral compass is going to be rightly guided. And just an example, 1920s, there was a whole movement called the flapper movement. And you can Google this, read much more on this. This was a movement that people were actually coming out and they were looking at how do we express ourselves? How do we express our sexuality? How do we express who we are the relative to what others are doing? So for example, in the 1915s, 1920s, that era, it was actually illegal for somebody to expose themselves with wearing shorts and, you know, a bikini. That was 
you know, about, you can say about almost a hundred years ago that continued on all the way till sixties. Now what happened is that moral compass of people changed. Now it was no longer unacceptable, rather it became acceptable. And we see the same thing happening in our generations, in our parents' generations, and the kids will see this time after time. It doesn't even have to be years. It could be just a few months and the entire norm and the entire way of thinking that is the accepted norm of the society is going to change. And that's why we need to understand the problem is that we're giving too much value to what others are thinking. And there is a norm and the world view that is being pushed that individuals are going to accept this worldview regardless of what their faith is, regardless of what their value is, regardless of who they are. And we have to understand this is not something that is universal. So if we look at all these fitness, you know, LGBT, atheism, a person is involved in just individualistic rights and they want to please themselves, sexual deviance, all of these things, the root cause of all of these things is considering yourself to be a person that is part of that society with the view of that society. And on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he teaches us that if a person grounds themselves and looks at the world according to what Islam is teaching, looks at the world according to how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying such and such matter, what descriptions in the Quran are mentioned about these sort of people that are doing certain actions, and I see those same actions and occur, uh, occurring right in front of me. When we understand that every single facet of our life will be according to the sunnah and according to the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. So, inshallah, the plan is we're going to go first talk about, you know, the, the movement of the LGBT, uh, G, LGBT agenda. And before getting into that, uh, we have to understand one important thing. And that important thing is that before we get into the nuances and what is right, wrong, and all those other things, it's very important that we understand that this sort of thinking and the line of thinking is something that is not universal. And rather, we have to remind ourselves of our basics. So inshallah, this week and the next week, we're going to look into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying as far as what is our basis. What do we bring our deen from? Where do we get our deen from? So the first ayat that we'll look at is establishing how the Quran is a kitab and a book that is of guidance. And we know this ayat very famously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the Quran with Surah Fatiha. And with Surah Fatiha, in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ He says, guide us to the straight path. And then the right after that, the, the surah right after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts, alif la mim, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي So a person has to wonder, what is the correlation between this last ayat and the ending of Surah Fatiha and the beginning of Surah Baqarah? And this is something the Mufassirun, they mention. And it's, it's widely known about this ayat that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings one ayat after another ayat, it's for us to understand that there is some sort of a link. There's a relationship between these things. And the link here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, kitabu la rayba fi, right after he said, Ihdina surat al -mustaqim. And then he said, guide us on the straight path, not the path of those that have earned your anger or your wrath, or they're misguided. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, what is that path? How do you figure that path out? The path that is set is in this kitab, in this book. There is no doubt in this. We see every single idea, everything in the world, there is some sort of a doubt. The aspects and the arguments, everybody is going to argue about something. But in the Quran, there is no doubt. There is no way of having shak or shubuhat. This is the complete book. That's why it teaches us that the Quran must be first and foremost when we understand what is going to be our worldview. How are we going to understand the world around us? The second ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, and this is a very powerful ayat. And I'll, I'll read the entire passage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this about societies and people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He said, entire societies, complete societies have passed before you. Go out in the land. Go see what happened to them. Go see what was the outcome of their disobedience. And what was the reason? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هذا بيان للناس وهدى وموعظة للمتقين This Quran, this is, it's not just a kitab. It's not just a revelation. هذا بيان للناس This is a clear guidance and a clear explanation for the people. وَهُدَى وَمَوْعِذَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And it is a clear explanation and guidance and advice for those who have taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the people, go out in the world, go see the different societies, go see the different uh, cultures. What happens when you see that? You see everybody has some sort of you know, uh, flaw. The only place where you will not find a flaw or a flaw in logic is going to be the Qur'an. And the Qur'an, this is going to be the guidance and this is going to be the advice for those that have taqwa. So this is the, this is the status of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last portion of uh, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the last portion of the ayat that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had gotten some spoils, you know, there was a battle and he, he received some spoils and he distributed those spoils. In the last portion of the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives you, accept it, and whatever he forbids you from, then stay away from it and let it go. Now, very interesting, the Mufassirun, they have a principle. Mufassirun are those individuals that are explaining the Qur'an as understood by the Sahaba, with riwayat, with narration. So they mention a very important point here. That the ayat is mentioning, Whatever the Prophet is uh, giving you, take it. What is it referring to? Anything that he is commanding you to do, then take it. And anything that he is stopping you from and forbidding you from doing, then stay away from it. This is in the general sense. al li umum al love the consideration and the the ibra is going to be for the generality of the verse la bi khusus sabab not the specific thing that the ayat is mentioning and the event that it was revealed for so we have to understand this anything that is found in the hadith this is part of our deen this is established and this is known that there are the usul of deen the quran the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the ijma of the sahaba and qiyas According to all the four madahib, these are the usul of deen. These are the usul and principles that we derive rulings and the, we derive uh, laws. So now we understand that the Quran is the source and the Quran is how we will understand what to do in this life. And we understand how do we understand the different fitness that are occurring around us. It's really interesting to see that the Quran itself has examples of the different world view of others. So in one place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the beginning of Surah Baqarah, He mentions about the munafiqun. What is their understanding, their way of thinking? The Ahl Kitab, what did they think about? That they didn't accept Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? Because he was from a different lineage. The people of uh, Mushrikeen, the pagan worshippers, what did they think? They thought, you know, they accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not that they rejected. They accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they said, this is just these idols that are in front of us. They're just intermediaries that will, that will connect us to Allah. So they said, you know, worship our idols one day and we'll worship your God one day. And then that's where lakum deenukum wal yadin came. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses, for you is your religion and for us is our religion. So this was a world view. This was a way of understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought examples of. Another is uh, when the people, they would be given message by the prophets. In hadha illa asatirul awwaleen. They will say, this is just nothing but fairy tales. Our forefathers used to say these things. That, you know, there's going to be a day of judgment. That when you pass away, when you die, there's going to be questioning. You're going to be resurrected. They said, 
and in hiya illa hayatuna dunya namut wa nahya wa ma nahnu bimabuuthin they have this view they have this understanding this is the only life we have this is the only life we have namut wa nahya we're going to die in it we're going to live in it wa ma nahnu bimabuuthin we're not going to be resurrected after this this is it this is the only thing that we need to do and what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought was the view of the muslims the believers the ones that had proper complete iman that when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told them now we need to go into the hardship and go on an expedition and fight they didn't even question rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wajilat qulubuhum when they saw the enemy their hearts trembled and they knew this was the right see rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this this is exactly what happened so this is another way that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the examples of those individuals that he mentions in the quran have different world views and why is that important this is important because we see a lot of the fitness a lot of the issues stem from this that if a person does is not based from the quran and sunnah every single thing we cannot discuss and we cannot give an answer for but if a person stems their iman and they stem their life from looking at everything through the lens of the quran looking at everything from the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then we will understand they will see themselves that this is the issue here and this is why we don't do such and such things so just to define some things we understood what is world view a set of beliefs about the world that ground and influence a person's way of thinking and acting and the world view of the dunya there's many many factors we're not going to go into the uh, factors of what created this imperialistic this uh, colonial type of mentality and this world view that people have there is a humanistic world view humanistic humanism is when a person is considering that all religions you don't need to follow religion just do good actions just do good actions and what's going to happen is you're going to give a good life and they took out god and allah from moral ethics moral ethics means anything that a person should be doing good good character good qualities good action that's your moral ethics that's the way that you live your life right ethics is the way that you conduct yourself there's many many books written by ethics for in ethics but when we understand the the start of individualism there's many philosophers but what happened is as time went on people started thinking this is the most complete this is the most progressive this is the most perfected way of thinking and that is the the western society that we find ourselves in and others find themselves in finding themselves that they will have for example same sex marriages why because it makes them happy they will kick their elderly and their seniors out of their homes whereas islam teaches completely opposite of that right they don't take care of them and then there is another you know capitalistic aspect of it if something financially is for their advantage of course they will be invading attacking they will be you know getting the oil but if something is on the other side morally right well that's something that is up to debate so in this humanistic world view there is something that is widespread and we have to understand another thing when something is widespread it becomes the popular culture it becomes the norm of every household you can't go to a store without seeing some sort of sign you can't go buy groceries without saying that we are we are celebrating pride pride month when you see that happening you should know that the world view is completely there is a a a, a way of thinking that has been defined by the western society and that's not something that is found everywhere in the world right let's just take us for the, the example you go to texas conservative texas you're not going to find the same things happening that's just the simple truth california just you know they passed a law that if a person of a parent they uh, don't affirm the change of gender for their child then it's considered part of child abuse in canada that already exists in parts of the us they're speaking about this and trying to bring this in so my point is if you go against that world view it's called hegemony right 
So th there's that huge way of thinking. If you go against that, immediately you are somebody that is, you know, a, you know, a bigot, somebody that hates somebody, somebody that is a racist or sexist or a homophobe or whatever. You get canceled. And that's how you know that there is no tolerance. That's how you know, because if there was tolerance, right? If you really had freedom of speech, when you spoke your freedom of speech and your religion and everything, it would not be canceled, it will not be shunned. But right now, it's the same as getting blocked. You'll get blocked from all your social media platforms. You'll be in school, you'll be the one that does not use pronouns, and you're gonna be the only one that doesn't use pronouns and you're gonna look as if you're a transphobe. Why? Because you're not affirming somebody's new identity. Right? So that's num point number two. Point number three is the Islamic worldview. And we are going to speak about that in those regards, inshallah. Um, so number one, the first ayat that we will look at. This is in Surah Furqan. This is a very, very powerful ayat. You know, those that have memorized this ayat, memorize this, look into the tafsir, very detailed tafsir. And you will see how much of evidence this ayat is giving us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he starts the surah. This is the beginning of Surah Furqan. He says, Tabaraka alladhi nazzal al-furqana ala abdihi liyakuna lil'alamina nadhira. Alladhi lahu mulku samawati wal-ard. Walam yattakhidh waladan walam yakun lahu sharikun fil mulki wa khalaka kulla shay'in faqaddarahu taqdira. This is one of the answers. This is the one of the verses that we really need to internalize, teach others. Why? Three aspects of this ayat. We'll speak about one at a time, but three aspects of this ayat directly change the way that we should be thinking as far as the, the LGBT agenda and as far as transgenderism. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the translation of this, he says, al-Furqan." Blessed be Allah, the one that has revealed the Furqan. Ala abdihi liyakuna nadira upon his slave so that he may warn the others, other beings. For him belongs the heavens, the dominion of the heavens and the earth. And he has not taken a child. He doesn't have any partners in his dominion, in his kingdom. And he has created every single thing and determined it in its exact form in an exact way there's three aspects we're going to look at in this ayat allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has not made and remember if, if we don't feel this and if our mind is you know uh kind of objecting to this that's okay because you know the society has filled our brains up society has told us that right is wrong and wrong is right that freedom is that you should be able to love is love. You can marry who you want. But we're going to see here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to us about something that is relative to what we're going through. So number one, we're, the first aspect of this ayat we're going to look at. وَخَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made every single thing in our life with a purpose. For example, you can't claim a single item in the creation, whether it's clothes, whether it's uh, the sun, moons, and the stars, whether it's your own body, nervous system, your digestive system, any sort of thing, you cannot claim that it does not have any sort of purpose. This is, this is the qudra, this is the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that we can all understand. Look at, for example, our own bodies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I mean, in the field of the Samawati, well, all what the laugh and lay you on the hard la ayat and you will albab in the changing of the heavens and the earth and the night becoming into the day and the day becoming into the night. You see all of these great things. What is this? These are signs that are indicating that hey, there is one Allah, there is a creator. You see our bodies, for example, if one one part of our body, something goes off. A, per, a person has an irregular heartbeat. That's not something normal. Immediately that something could be from that. A person, they just imagine in your own body, 
you have about 45, 37, 45 miles of nervous uh, nerves in, 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 in a six feet body. You have so many miles of nerves, veins, and all of these things. If the, if the entire rotation of the earth were to tilt not even one degree, but a minute degree, then you would see the entire seasons changing, burning happening, ice age happening. You would see places that don't have snow getting snow. If we were one degree in the revolution from where we're, uh, uh, um, we're orbiting, you would see entire catastrophes happening. This is just one example. How can we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has insan and he has made insan? We have nobilified Bani Adam. But there's no point and there's no need. That doesn't make sense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has, he has a purpose for each and every single thing. And the ayat that we mentioned, وَخَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions very interesting ayat. The word taqdeer comes from the word qadara. Right? Huruf asli qadara. And it means that a person has a amount or it means a person is given a might and a power. Right? Qudra. Having the capability. Right? When you take it into Bab Tafreed, when you take it to the next form, the second form, it means that every single thing is exact and it's appropriated. So when we see in this example, how is this relating back to the discussion of how do we change our worldview and have the Islamic worldview? You see people, they say that, you know, certain things are, I'm born with it. Certain feelings, I'm born with it. And we'll discuss those things. But how does this fit in? They're changing the way that they're built. They're changing the way that they are designed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَخَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Every single thing has been fashioned and has been made. فَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا And He has given it exact measurements, exact proportion. That nothing is off. There's nothing off. Exactly how it's designed. The way insan is, if our hands, for example, had our nose, you know, you scratch yourself, you're not going to be just scratching yourself, you're going to be smelling something. If we had to go to the bathroom in a different fashion, a person wouldn't be able to live. That's why all those aspects, the way a person is, all of those things have been fashioned completely by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no mistakes. There is no mistakes. You may say, oh, what if people, you know, they have a disability. That's been fashioned, that's been designed on purpose, if you can say that, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that person will have this disability, that person will have this deficiency. Why? Because this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test that person. And that is something that we need to understand. So every single thing is in perfect way and perfect design. Another ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you really think that you have been created عبثن, as of a amusement that there is no need for you but you know let's just see what happens when we put two humans together no this is not a game Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not having toy and fun with us he's putting this putting us in this dunya so that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Do you really think you're going to be in this world? You're just playing around and then you're not going to go back to Allah? And then right after that, he says, فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ Glory and might be to the king. مَلِكُ الْحَقِّ The king of the, the truth. This is, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our, our world, people... I think uh, it's 68% of Americans. 68%? The about 70% you can say. That's two out of three Americans. Two out of three Americans are trying to figure out what is their purpose in life. This is a reality. Two out of three individuals you see walking around, you can kind of estimate that in their mind, they have this question, what is my purpose? Why am I here? 
What am I going towards? And they're trying to figure that out. So the biggest lesson that teaches us, the biggest important ibrah that we can take from this is every single thing has its purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not just put us without a purpose. So when we understand this in our worldview, we need to understand my body, my mentality, my intellect, my desires, all of those have a purpose. I'm saying also desires have a purpose. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا He has put and instilled these things in our, in our uh, egos and nafs. If, we don't, if a person doesn't feel desires, there's something wrong with them. So these things are part of the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us in the world for. The last ayat regarding this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَهُ He is the one who has perfected the creation. And he has created insan from uh, clay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, he has perfected that creation. You see many times on social media and you know people sending you all these videos. right? Somebody sent me a video of a person getting married to themselves. So uh, what, what's your reaction for this? You know, what, what reaction can I give for that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions he has created every single person in the best form, in the best manner. This is to show that our feelings, every single aspect of our life, whatever a person feels is the best manner. And it doesn't have to be according to, it's not going to be an easy life. No, I want to make that clear too. Every insan is in this dunya for Darul Ibtila. This is the world of testing. For example, you have an exam coming up. You're not going to pass that just because, you know, it's easy. No. Or else, what's the reward? You're not even going to get any benefit. It has to be hard. It has to be a struggle. And when you struggle and you go through that, then you will get the, the, the reward of it. The second part of this ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Mulk. In this ayat, he mentions very beautifully, again, no, this is another aspect that we should really look into how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives his arguments to us and his the way that we should have our understanding of the dunya. He says, mulk, wa huwa ala kulli qadir. He says, Blessed is he who has the entire kingdom in his hands. He is the one who has power over everything. He is the one who created death and life. He mentioned death first. Why? Because that's the one that is important. That's when we're really going to live. That's when we're eyes, our eyes will open up. He is the one who created death and life to test us which of you is in best action. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions He is the one, He is almighty, He is all forgiving. He's the one who created seven heavens in layers. And you won't find a single flaw in His creation of the most merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, look at the heavens. Right? We see this, mashallah, our masjid. You know, very beautiful chandelier. Nice calligraphy. How is, it, how is it built? Okay, you have, you know, foundation. Then you have the, the framing. You have pillars in the middle. You have a whole structure in place. You go outside, look at the entire sky. Show me where the foundation is. Show me where the pillars are. Show me where, where is the support beams. There's no beams. Every single thing in the, the sky, it, you can go in a plane and keep going and you're not going to bump into a foundational beam. Nowhere. Why? This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. Insan, compared to the heavens and the earth, is much less. In creation, I'm saying. And the value, of course, it's higher than everything. But in creation, that's much more complicated. If, if we were to understand in our sense, when people say that, you know, we're feeling such feelings and I cannot deal with these feelings. And what should I do? There's a difference. 
about what the creation is and who the creator is. The creator has designed us and the creation needs to recognize that creator so that we can worship that creator. So you go through the entire sky, there's no beams. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَرْجِعِ basar." Go back and look again. You saw it one time, okay. You saw it, that was really good. But go again and look if there's any flaw in the creation. And what will happen? Do you see any gaps? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, He gives it another third argument. ثُمَّ رَجِعِ basar." Karlatain. Then go again, look at, uh, return your glances at the skies again. Karlatain. Two times. Yanqalib ilayk al basaru khasi al mahu hasir. You're gonna look. You're gonna look. You're gonna look. Your eyes are gonna come down, and you're gonna be like, "There's no flaw. Everything is perfect." This is this is what we need to understand that when when we when we look at our role in in society, in our role in as far as these fitnas, especially I'm talking about the LGBT. There's transgenders, gender roles. People are fluid. They'll wake up as a man, they'll go to sleep as a woman. They'll be multiple thems, right? There's, there's multiple genders. Is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flawed? No. You see how many examples Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving. The role of the insan is to recognize that design of Allah. When we recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fashioned us in the complete perfected manner, number one, we will know there is no flaw. Number two, we will recognize our purpose in dunya. That 68 person I was saying, they will recognize what is the actual way of living. So we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us this will and He gives us our desires so that we can have it conforming to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the purpose of our life. We have not created jinn and insan except to worship us. When we recognize that this is by a creator, what does that demand us that we should be doing? That demands that we should be now following and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not supposed to be something easy. right? And, and I'll get into this in the next few weeks, inshallah. But it's not something that is easy. Why? Because you need to understand whatever desires we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, Wala taqrabu zina. Don't come close to zina. Wala taqtulu nafs allati haram Allah. Don't kill a person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sanctified. So all of these verses, all of these things, they're to test us. Even if a person has attraction, but if a person lives within the bounds of deen, right? There's a difference between same sex attraction. And same-sex behavior. A person is attracted. Okay. Maybe that is the 1.9%. Right? The less than 1% of the individuals. Sure. Let's give it that. But there is a huge difference between the attraction and the behavior of a person. We have to understand our role in the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fashioned us in perfection. He's given us the signs that we can see. And he's given us a purpose. People, we don't have to think about, you know, what is my purpose? I don't, I don't know what my purpose is. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us our purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that you will not find a single flaw in the creation. basar. Look again. Karratain. Look again. You're going to find. Khasi huwa hasir. You're going to look down and you're going to say, you know, there is no flaw in what I see. The third important thing to remember as far as creating our mindset and our worldview is the last portion of the Surah Furqan, the beginning of Surah Furqan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tabaraka alladhi nazzal al-furqana ala abdihi liyakuna lil'alamina nadira. So we had that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed us perfectly. We had, He has given us a purpose. And now when you have a design and you have established that there is a purpose in this life, how do we look at the world now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nazzal al furqan The word furqan. So the translation of this is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Blessed is he who has sent down the furqan to his slave so that he can be a warner to all beings. So if we look at what is this? Furqan comes from the huruf asli, the root words of faraqa. Faraqa yafruku. To separate or to 
differentiate. And when you bring it to another scale, for example, farraqa yufarriqu tafriq. That's a separation. That's something that is, you know, there's se uh, separation in the views and values. Furqan is a judge that differentiates what is right, what is haq, and what is wrong, batil. So another name for the Qur'an is Al-Furqan. The Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He revealed this Qur'an, He gave it another name also. There's many names of the Qur'an, Al-Um and Kitab and Qur'an. Furqan is another name of the Qur'an. What does it do? الَّذِي يَفْرُقُ بَيْنَ الْحَقِّ وَالْبَاطِلِ The Qur'an is given the name of Furqan here in this ayat and in other places. Why? Because it differentiates what is right and wrong. So we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed us perfectly. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us complete purpose. And he didn't leave us just like that. Many times I hear, you know, uh, on these YouTube videos, people are asking, you know, if Jesus were here, what would he say? Right? Some cer certain situation happens. You know, if Jesus was here, what, what would he say? The beautiful thing is when on the Hajjatul Wida, there was an ayat that was revealed. It's such a powerful ayat that the people that heard this ayat, they said, if we only knew about this verse, we would have made this day a day of celebration. The Jews said this. And what was that ayat? الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this. Today, I have completed your religion for you. And I have perfected my favors upon you. Meaning everything we need is in the Quran. And I have selected Islam as your religion. In another place, Whoever selects a deen and a path other than Islam, it will never be accepted from that person. So what does this teach us? What does this teach us? That the Quran, the Furqan, is the way that we will know what is morally ethical. We don't need to figure out Mm, I think this is such and such thing. I think such and such thing. There's some interviews, you know, they're asking doctors and senators. They're asking people who apparently are supposed to be qualified and educated in this field. They're asking them, define to us what is a man and define to us what is a woman. Why you have women going in men's sports? You have men going in women's sports. The built, the bone density of a man is different. The muscle mass of a man is different. How are you going to have them competing with somebody else? And then forget that. You have, in our Fremont, you go to some restaurants, you have all gender bathrooms. I would be weirded out going into the bathroom and I don't know who, if I open the door, what am I going to find? This is a real issue. If we don't push back, you know what's going to happen? We're going to get a ro rollover. And this is why the moral ethics of our deen and what Quran is teaching us is the way that we have to live our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he already revealed the verses. He already told us our guide is Islam. Without that, we will not know what is right or what is wrong. And the Quran, we need to understand any sort of issue that comes, we need to understand it can be based upon humans. If it's based upon humans and their logic and their way of thinking, it's going to be flawed. This simply said is going to be flawed. But if it's based on the sunnah, it's based in what Rasulullah has taught us of the explanation of the Quran and the tafsir of the verses, then we know this is going to be sound. That even if we don't, you know, understand the benefits of this ruling or understand the evilness of this, this prohibition, we need to understand that there is going to be a benefit or a harm that we just don't know and understand. That is why the Quran is called the Furqan. So we understand. That is the Furqan that differentiates what is right and wrong. So to recap and end off, inshallah, if a person sees the entire world, there is a, there is a very influential there is actually, I would call an agenda. I call this an agenda. Why? For many reasons. One of that reason is you see corporations, their whole purpose is to make money, isn't it? You see Target, 
you know, others, their whole purpose is to make money. If they're not making money, what are they doing then? They are willing to lose billions of dollars a week to support an agenda that is still making them lose money. Why? Because they've taken loans from higher ups and there is an active agenda being pushed so that people, they do certain actions, certain laws are being implemented, certain values or quote unquote values are being imp implemented. And if we understand that this is coming out into the entire world, that they're being lobbying in the schools, school curriculums, the primary classes, sad, but that's what's happening. Colleges, everywhere you will see the normal thing that is now progressive, the normal thing that is now accepted is that, you know, if you, you need to identify with the gender. You don't have to be the same gender. You can change whatever you want. Why? Because that's how you identify. And you see Islam, that worldview is not something that is uh, the view of the entire universal humanity. And so we need to understand that's just something that is from the Western side. It's not something that is, you know, all over. And more importantly, we need to recognize the Islamic worldview. We recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed and fashioned us. And he has designed all of creation, which gives us a purpose. Because we weren't here just to play around. And when we have a purpose, we need to know how do we live our life. And we need to understand what are we going to do. And that is in the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And the end result of all of that logical flow is that a person realizes that they must submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they must be in peace with the rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given spiritually, physically, emotionally, in all senses. And that will be falah. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, indeed, he has attained a great success. And this is the ultimate purpose. Inshallah, next week, we'll discuss more on the Islamic framework of the ahkam and the ayat that speak about our responsibility of our bodies. What is sex? What is marriage? What is sexual deviance? And inshallah, this will build up on how do we actually address these issues. And we have to have a premises that everybody agrees on, everybody understands so that we can actually make an argument against something. We make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us tawfiq and allows us to understand this and bring this into our lives. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil a'asad ima yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. If there's any questions, uh, you can ask questions inshallah.